Hello and a warm welcome to all. Before we begin, I just want to check that my mic is working today. Bruce, can you hear me? Yes, okay, great. So good morning to those of you waking up with us today, joining from perhaps across the Americas. Uh, good afternoon to those listening in from the African continent or from Europe. And good evening to attendees from Asia and the Pacific. A very warm welcome to this informational webinar for the Climate Adaptation and Resilience or CLAIR initiative. It's really wonderful to see that so many of you are joining us for this virtual session today. My name is Heidi Braun, and I'm a Senior Program Officer at IDRC and part of the CLAIR team. I'll be your host for today's webinar, and I'm speaking to you from near Ottawa in Canada. I'd like to acknowledge that IDRC's head office and those of us working from home located in and around Ottawa live and work on the unceded ancestral territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. Today, we're holding this webinar with the aim of helping address any questions you might have about the program and our recently launched call for concept notes. Just to let you know, we're recording today's session to share with you after, and we'll make the recording available to anyone unable to join for this live webinar on our website. Uh, we also have a session in French beginning at 9 a.m. Eastern time, and the recording from that French language webinar will also be available on our website after. Next slide, please. So the plan for this one hour session is to first provide a presentation, including a quick overview of the CLEAR initiative and followed by a more fulsome overview of the call for concept notes, including eligibility, what we're looking for in the concept notes and evaluation criteria. Uh, we expect the presentation should take roughly 20 or 30 minutes, leaving us the second half of the hour to respond to questions. Next slide, please. So we'll be using the Q&A feature to receive and respond to your questions today. You are welcome to submit a question at any time during this webinar, including during the presentation. Uh, some of my colleagues are working behind the scenes today and they'll be able to provide a written reply to some of your questions. We will also select questions to answer during the live Q&A period following the presentation. We will try to prioritize those questions that are upvoted. So please do like any questions you feel are important by clicking on the thumbs up symbol to the right of the question. We will also prioritize questions that are recurring or those that are not already answered in the call document or our FAQs already available online. Um, in case it's helpful, I'll ask my colleague Erica to provide a link to these documents now. Um, Bear with us, it's very possible that we may not be able to get to all of your questions during this short hour. Uh, if you do pose a question that we're not able to answer, uh, either because we run short on time or because it's something we need to give more thought to, we will include the question and answer in an updated version of the FAQs. So again, an invitation to submit your questions using the Q&A function. Just select the My Questions tab and type your question in the text box. Okay, I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Bruce Curry Alder for the presentation. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you, Heidi. I'm really pleased to be able to give a brief overview both of the initiative and what we're looking for in this particular call. Uh, the overall thrust of CLAIR is there, as you see on the, the screen, that we are intending to fund research that enables social inclusive sustainable action and builds resilience to climate change across and natural hazards for people across the global south. As we've seen with the recent IPCC report, we now have a sort of state of the art of what's happening in terms of adaptation and the rising and disproportionately felt risks uh, that are associated with climate change. So we want to be able to ensure that we are helping foster the research that will create the solutions that could help cut across sectors and systems and address inequalities to enable a more climate resilient future for, for everyone. So this uh, initiative that we have now formally launched is looking specifically across Africa and the Asia Pacific and trying to ensure that we give the uh, scale and urgency required in research moving forward. This is also a collaboration with the UK government, uh, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, 
and represents a new phase of collaboration between our two organizations. The objectives. Uh, so at the heart of Claire, we're hoping to be able to move forward on these four aspects. Uh, to really being able to maximize the uptake of existing knowledge. There's so much we already know, but to get it into, into use really matters. Yet we also realize that we need to continue driving the development of new knowledge that will support adaptation and boost resilience for the most vulnerable. And to enable capacity, not just of researchers to do research, but to actually bridge that gap that we see sometimes between research and action to achieve more sustainable climate resilient development. And ultimately at the end of the day, uh, support gender responsive and inclusive practical action. So we're designed the program with this view in mind that everything ultimately is helping us achieve that collectively. And when I say achieving that, what are some of the outcomes at a very high level one would see? Uh, ultimately, we want to see the strength in agency, particularly in these regions in the Global South, to do and use research for adaptation action. And that actionable adaptation solutions are created that could help support the most vulnerable. What would that mean within individual projects and sets of projects? We'd be looking for these types of outputs, whether it be tested adaptation tools, data and technologies that decision makers and practitioners can actually uh, get their hands on and use. We also realize that in this age of implementation, climate action requires strong cross-sectoral transdisciplinary networks dedicated to adaptation action. So bringing together diverse actors, and I'll mention a bit more on that in a moment. And obviously this emphasis on capacity across the whole value chain. So being able to see not just uh, scholarships and exchanges, but also the ability to really strengthen the capacity of turning research into action along the way, and everyone that may be involved in that chain. And ultimately we know it's not enough to adapt to the world that already exists or is about to exist. The climate and the world will continue changing out to 2030 and the coming decades. So that knowledge that could help us realize the transformational change, not just incremental adaptation. At a very high level, the call for concept notes articulates these three research themes and they're intentionally not sectoral. They're cutting across sectors and trying to really understand how those multiple time horizons and overlaps can occur. So in the first instance, risk informed early action. So being able to already take uh, action to what we know about uh, climate risk or those climate risks that already exist. There's still the need to understand how those will evolve, including as we've been speaking <clears throat> in trying to digest some of the recent IPCC reports, the uh, nature of cascading compounding risks, how will they evolve over the coming years and decades? And then ultimately bringing this back to achieving the SDGs. How do we develop in a changing climate? How do we ensure that our people are able to survive and thrive uh, in a changing world? And that includes multiple aspects, everything from heat stress to food systems uh, to water. So there are these three broad themes and we expect projects will be able to situate themselves within that. We don't expect anyone will be right in the middle, but to perhaps be at the interface or squarely in one of those circles, but ultimately as a portfolio, we hope that uh, all will come together and reinforce each other. So let me turn to this call for concept notes. Uh, what we're hoping to do with this first initial broad call is create the initial portfolio of research projects focusing on climate adaptation across Africa and Asia. So effectively the call is with the overall ambition of CLAIR itself. Uh, depending on the results of this and how the uh, portfolio evolves over the coming year, we do anticipate there will be future calls that will be more modest in funding and more focused, uh, but this is the big one, if you will. And we're looking for transdisciplinary teams working on one or more of the Claire themes we've just described. But again, being able to situate yourself within that space without trying to say you're doing it all. Uh, we also realize that the potential for moving forward on uh, research for climate action 
can uh, be at different scales. So there are intentionally these two sizes of funding available. Uh, for lack of a better word, we call them smaller and larger. Uh, the smaller ones being up to about 1.5 million Canadian over 42 months. Uh, and the larger ones, which are between 6 to 8 million in that amount of time as well. So we expect the time frame for each project would be the same. It's just the size of budget that's that's different. One other nuance between the two different sizes is what we have called as IDRC and FCDO, the lead organizations. And uh, just to be clear, in the definition for this call for concept notes, a lead organization simply means that the organization that would have a direct funding relationship or a grant agreement with IDRC. We understand there are multiple ways of exercising leadership within a research project, be it the design activities, uh, what are some of the analysis, uh, who does what is, is another aspect. But in a narrow definition of who would be getting the funding, uh, we're hoping that in smaller projects, there would be a single recipient and in larger ones up to three. Now, we also in the call document elaborate on collaborating partners, and there's no limit on those. Uh, other participants that are necessary to get the vision the project anticipates into action that would then be in essentially a sub grantee role, but not having a direct funding relationship with IDRC. Let me take a step back and say, at the end of the day, what are we hoping for out of this call? So we've uh, tentatively said about 56 million Canadian will be allocated through this call. And we do expect to have a split. Uh, we're hoping that about 30, 30, 40% of the funding would be across the, the three themes to ensure that we do cover them all. Uh, and that in ultimately in terms of smaller and larger projects, we're looking for about eight of each. Uh, and all of this will be determined uh, precisely along the way, in part depending on the quality and number of great ideas we, we get. And ultimately, we do expect at least half of the funding that we do allocate will be on the African continent, African region. Now that I've already introduced um, geography, in a second I'll go into eligible countries, but before I do, I want to just elaborate on the comments here that we're not expecting only to integrate or mainstream gender equality and inclusion considerations, but within each of the themes, we'll expect at least one project would actually embrace gender equality and inclusion questions and focus as the main uh, focus for the research that's being done. So into eligibility, uh, as we said, broadly, Africa, and Asia Pacific. And so the list of countries that are in the annex are broadly those. And the distinction between smaller and larger projects, smaller projects would have activities be focused on at least one of those countries. Uh, larger ones would be at least two. And again, we're trying to be very light and broad in our eligibility criteria here. One could imagine a project that has a half dozen or more project uh, countries and maybe spread across the two regions. But as a minimum, uh, one has to have activities in a or two countries within in these regions. Uh, happy to entertain further questions that come out. This has been a source of uh, some questioning along the way. And if you have further clarification you need uh, that's not provided uh, in the FAQ, we'll be able to address that. I think I've already introduced the role of a lead organization and the very narrow definition of lead in this case being those that receive funding from us. Uh, we've already received some interest about, so what qualifies as an eligible organization? And again, we've taken a very broad uh, approach to that. Uh, eligible organization must have its own legal identity. It must be recognized as an organization. We've already mentioned the ability to receive and manage funds. Uh, but beyond that, uh, we expect that projects could be led by and ultimately involve collaboration with a broad range of organizations, be it universities, think tanks, non-governmental organizations, knowledge brokers, practitioners, civil society group, uh, local government entities, uh, private sector entities, and more. 
again, we will need eventually to see that there's an independent legal status, that they're capable of managing the, the funds. Uh, in the first instance, though, with the call for concept notes, if I can boil it down, we're looking for promising ideas and promising teams. So don't worry too, too much about some of the fine print, I would say, about uh, how do I prove I'm a legal agent. It, we were looking in this first stage of concept notes to get down to a set of really promising ideas that we will be inviting to full proposals and that will have uh, further details. So we've intentionally kept the concept note pro step of the process fairly light. Uh, and as was mentioned, collaborating partners is our language that we're using to refer to those organizations that would be part of our project, but not necessarily, well, not having a direct funding relationship with IDRC. So what are the expectations of projects? I said we're looking for promising ideas and teams. So what are some project ideas, concept notes that are worth investing in in their own uh, merits? I think we also should be clear that we're looking for those project teams that are really interested in being part of the Claire community and how you may be able to both contribute to that Claire community and why you may be interested in being part of it. So what are the conditions of membership, if you will? What are the benefits of being part of the, the Claire community? So I think in terms of expectations, we can really boil it down to these four plus one, and I'll go through each of the four in a moment. But just to say, ultimately, we do expect Claire will become more than the sum of its parts, that we are expecting projects not just to receive funding and do good work on their own, but be, again, part of that collaborative community that will be able to share and learn across. And that ultimately being part of that is uh, its own attraction, if you will, beyond just receiving funds. So let me go through each of these uh, approaches of Claire in turn. First, research for impact. That should have already been very clear from the objectives, what the program's all about, how we'll be measuring success in terms of outcomes and outputs. And to say very bluntly, Claire endorses the principles that have been articulated by the newly launched Adaptation Research Alliance. They're articulated here. There are links to the references in the um, uh, the call document and the, the FAQ. And we strongly encourage the inclusion of knowledge brokering expertise or collaborative partners within projects. We ex ultimately expect that Claire projects will not just be advancing the frontiers of knowledge, but seeing that that knowledge is actually put into, into use. Uh, so if one probes the principles, you get into aspects of being needs driven, solution oriented, co-producing with uh, with users. I could go on, but they are already quite well articulated by the Alliance, which both IDRC and FCDO are part of. The next principle that I'm really passionate about is the idea of bringing together diverse and equitable partnerships. We're in this age of implementation. We know a lot about a changing climate. We need to do something about it. So that's where we really see this is an era where all hands on deck, if I can use that phrase. We need to bring together diverse organizations that have complementary skills. None of our institutions are perhaps able to do it alone. This is a part of the logic of why IDRC and FCDO are working together. There's the complementarities we can each bring to this. But also within projects, we're expecting to see organizations bring complementary things together to link research and action. So the quick equitable partnerships aspect of it is critical as well. Even though we've now articulated this sort of lead organization and collaborating partner as two distinct roles just based on funding flow, we do expect ultimately that project participants will come together and have some shared responsibility for research design, implementation, uptake, and that ultimately there are some mechanisms for mutual accountability for progress, outputs, and outcomes. So really seeing how does that genuine uh, equitable partnership lie at the base of those who are working together in each of the projects is something we're really keen on being able to, to encourage. Third, and we've mentioned this uh, already, is capacity strengthening. And I've already previewed how we, we understand strengthening of capacity in 
a couple of nuanced ways. One is that capacity already exists. It doesn't need to necessarily be built. Recognizing that there is that capacity, sometimes facing certain barriers, uh, how does one overcome that? And that capacity that's not just within the research system to do research, but the ability to translate that into society to those who are engaged in the practice of adaptation and the pursuit of climate action. How do we make those links stronger and ultimately ensure that we're not limited by a weakest link or a, a gap of some sort? So we do encourage activities within these projects that would be able to strengthen the capacity of relevant stakeholders and the project team itself. Uh, so we're purposely somewhat broad in our thinking on that. We have some scoping paper and references that are available that articulate this a little bit better uh, or in more depth. Yet just to say those are strongly encouraged as uh, eligible expenses within uh, potential projects. Gender equality and inclusion uh, is key to sustainable climate action. Uh, we've already heard time and again over the past number of months and years how the impacts of climate change are not felt evenly. There are those that are uh, more at risk or feel the risks more acutely when things do ha happen. So we do not expect we will fund a project that is gender or social inclusion blind, if you will. Uh, we were, are asking projects to identify to what extent have they incorporated the lenses of gender equality and inclusion, and we have an annex that describes this in, in greater depth, including supporting materials identified through the frequently asked questions. And again, we're asking projects to help identify, are they integrating this into their work? So you may be focused on a particular climate risks and adding or incorporating the uh, awareness and sensitivity or responsiveness to gender equality and inclusion considerations? Or is this specifically the focus? Are you really interested in how different people or women and men or people of different ages or location are exposed to differential risks and really understanding uh, those as this core of what you're doing? And again, we want to ensure a balanced portfolio at the end of the day that includes both. Uh, so just because your project may not be focused on uh, gender equality and inclusion doesn't mean it's not eligible. It just means, OK, then you're integrating it into the, the project in different ways. Uh, but again, we've set the bar, if you will, that we will not be uh, considering any proposals that are just blind and silent on these considerations. Uh, justification. So we do ask for preliminary budget, uh, yet I want to encourage everyone to think about the question that associated with that, because that's what we're really looking for. We've set out these potential amounts of funding that are available for allocation, uh, and we're socializing, we're sharing with you what are the ultimate categories in which a grant agreement and budget would be refined. Uh, do your best, take your best estimate of how you might allocate that budget across these different categories and across the lead organizations if it's a larger project. And ultimately what we're looking for is two things. The most important and the question that is in the concept notes, uh, why is this funding required? You know, what's the justification for it? Uh, and that sort of ability for us to be able to understand uh, what is the potential value for money, what's the justification for these resources, if you will. And that's part of the obligation of funders to be able to, to ask that type of question. It will also allow us to get an insight into your early thinking and identify any points that if your idea is really attractive and invited to a full proposal, we'll want to uh, see a little bit more or have it in exchange about how that budget could be refined moving forward. So we have provided links to guidance that does say what our regular uh, policies and procedures are at IDRC, yet do just put forward your best thinking in terms of a budget and where there may be uh, points to, to clarify down the road. Uh, just submit your best thinking and we'll consider that for those projects that are carried forward into the next phase 
into full proposals where budgets will be refined further. So we do have the references and guidance under question 26 of frequently asked questions, but to take that as guidance in this case and just put forward your best thinking uh, in this. So the real concern for us is that question of, so why does this amount of funding make sense? And ultimately, do we think that makes sense compared to everything else? So that brings me to almost the last slide about how are we going to be evaluating these concept notes? And here, as transparently as we can make it, is the evaluation criteria. And indeed, if you go through the concept note uh, application system, very much the flow is already in line with this. Uh, ultimately, it's all about high quality research. So a significant amount of that is put in, of the evaluation weighting is put into to that. Yet the definition of quality has multiple dimensions. And in line with IDRC's Research Quality Plus framework, yet tailored to uh, the CLARE design, uh, we are looking for scientific rigor, uh, considerations of gender quality and inclusion in the design and the activities, the originality and relevance of the proposed research, research for impact, that ability to actually get research knowledge into use somehow, and the capacity strengthening potential, what's been articulated as uh, what the project could achieve or contribute to in that respect. Then also mentioning team composition and equitable partnerships is part of it and the overall coherence justification of resources. So we're not going to be scoring, as I said, about this particular budget line and that particular budget line. Does it completely align with our, our guidance yet? It's like, does this hang together? Does it make sense given what the overall objectives uh, and uh, proposed research is? Um, is it, does it make sense uh, that this scale of funding is required for that type of activity? Team composition, I'll just return to that for a moment, that also is an aspect of gender equality and inclusion. So who's involved in your team? Who are the participating actors? Or you know, at one level is, are women there? But also are um, people of diverse uh, social identity involved in this as well? So again, it, we purposely chose gender equality and inclusion because it's not just about male or female, we also see social diversity in multiple dimensions. Want to see that not just in what's being proposed as activities, that's a little bit more under the research design, but also in who's doing the work, uh, the team composition. We've mentioned in the call for concept notes, I believe we strongly encourage uh, Southern leadership and want to see uh, collectively out of projects that Southern based researchers, leaders and organizations have a strong role in CLARE projects, yet we have not put that as a eligibility criteria. So an organization based elsewhere working in partnership with uh, Africans and Asians uh, is eligible to put forward their ideas, yet we will be looking at to what extent is Southern leadership coming through strongly in the portfolio of projects that will be invited to move forward. So finally, uh, before I hand it back to Heidi, uh, the timelines, we're already into this call for concept notes. Today is the information session, and we are keeping this intentionally open for a bit longer than some calls up until June 7th. Uh, after which we will have the process of evaluating proposals or those concept notes and identifying a shorter list of those we'll invite to prepare full proposals. That will happen about mid-July with those proposals due end of uh, September and we expect to be able to notify projects of the funding decision uh, by mid to, to late November. So perhaps with that I can turn it back to you Heidi. Great, thanks Bruce. Thanks to all of you uh, who have joined us today. I see some of you have joined since the, the session began. And just to remind you, the full session has been or is being recorded and will be posted online afterwards. So you can catch up on anything you may have missed at the start. Um, we now have time for your questions and I see a lot of questions are coming in, which is fantastic. Um, as we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, 
We are using the Q&A function to receive your questions. Uh, we're going to prioritize questions that are upvoted, those that are recurring or those that might not have been answered in the information already online, such as the call document and our FAQs. So if you see a question that you'd like to hear us answer, go ahead and click on the thumbs up symbol beside the question to like or to vote for that question. Uh, you might have noticed that uh, myself or other colleagues have been providing some written replies to your questions and we'll we'll try to do that uh, over the course of um, the webinar just because they're you know we have we're short on time and we'll we're trying to get through as many questions as we can so without further ado let's look at the questions that are coming in so i see um Bruce, there's a, a preoccupation about whether bids by northern institutions might be less likely to be funded. So I'll put that question to you uh, maybe to kick off our Q&A session now. So it's a great question and it is one we've struggled with ourselves and ultimately came down to uh, no. A, a, any organization is eligible to apply for the funding and will be given due consideration. We have a multiple sets of things we're expecting out of the Clare portfolio, collectively what projects we'll be able to, to achieve. And at the same time, we've heard, including from Southern Partners, that the nature of uh, Southern leadership can be exercised in multiple ways. So the very narrow definition of uh, lead organization we're following is an organization that receives funding from IDRC, just to simplify things in terms of number of budgets and grant agreements moving around, uh, that's a consideration. Yet there are instances where we've heard from uh, organizations based in the Global South that's not what they're most interested in, that they are able to exercise uh, their leadership through research design, through the activities, through their participation, and they're perfectly happy to have another organization be based in the UK or in the Global North, handle some of the budgeting arrangements and that they're able just to uh, participate in other ways. So we will be considering uh, the two aspects, eligibility, which is uh, in somewhat geography blind in terms of the applicant organization and really only looking at where these activities come being carried out and for the benefit of. Uh, so that's where the geography comes in. And then the evaluation criteria, which again is considering the substance of the, the work, not just uh, who's doing it. So really understanding how does one work together as a team. That's the purpose of that uh, criteria of diverse and equitable partnerships, because we understand it can be expressed in different ways. So the simple answer, Northern institutions can apply and will be considered equally uh, along the way. Great, thanks Bruce. And I, I noted there was another question about whether uh, the lead organization needed to be based in one of the eligible countries and I've provided an answer but I'll just I'll just repeat it here for, for the sake of everyone listening that no the lead institution does not need to be based in one of the eligible countries in Africa or Asia so just so that is clear for all um, another question uh, is about the nature of uh, the thematic or the sectoral nature of the focus of the research. So the question coming in from Johnny Casey is, do projects need to be multi-sectoral or could they focus on one sector such as agriculture? Or two, Bruce. So agriculture is huge. I would say it's much more than just a sector. Uh, yet uh, to keep an answer concise, no, that's fine. Uh, the themes are intentionally broad because we want to describe the entire canvas that is under the Clare Research Framework. We do expect projects to situate themselves in this. Uh, so if one has a narrower focus uh, on agriculture or food systems, not trying to do food, energy and something else, that's fine. We just want you to be able to articulate where you are situated in respect to those 
three broad themes and perhaps self-identify which uh, is more closely aligned or do you feel greatest affinity for? I also see questions coming in about um, the nature of the lead institution and uh, uh, questions around preference for um, the experience of that organization. So the question more specifically that's being upvoted by a, a number of our attendees is from Charlene Asamoah, and she asks, will it count against uh, a, a proposal if it is led by a local NGO that may not have a very big record of leading large funding bids? Um, in the call, we mentioned that you know we're looking for strong southern leadership, but that might mean we get a, a concept note from an organization that does not have that doesn't fit sort of our traditional types or size of organizations, such as universities or research institutes. And Charlene is wondering if that will count against their bid. Pass it over to you to answer Charlene's question, Bruce. So a concise answer is no, that will not count against a bid at this point. So this is a call for concept notes. We're looking for interesting, promising teams and ideas. And then those that once we go through the evaluation criteria we've seen that are invited to prepare a full proposal, any concerns that may be along the way we'll be able to address at that point. Uh, we're not requiring at this moment that a institution that's identified as a lead organization, a lead recipient of funding, uh, has a demonstrated track record. We have signaled what we do need ultimately at the end of the day, which is that they are a legal entity. They can prove being an independent organization and have an ability to, to manage funds. Uh, every organization has certain uh, features around them that then you know, will be subject to um, what we call within IDRC institutional risk or you know what's the uh, nature of the organization and as an organization IDRC has much experience of funding a range of organizational sizes and everything from the small NGO and local government to uh, international organizations with thousands of employees, uh, large universities you've mentioned as well. So the simple answer is it does not count against you. We are willing to hear and entertain the ideas that come from uh, small local organizations, even if they're newer and don't have that established track record. And I see another question less about the nature of the lead organization, but rather about the qualifications uh, that we're looking for for the principal investigator. And so the question is, does she or he have to be a PhD holder at an academic institution? I hope I, I hope by now our listeners have heard that uh, we're not necessarily requiring that the lead institution be a university, um, but Bruce, maybe you could tell us a bit more about the nature of the qualifications for the principal investigator that we would be looking for. Thank you. Uh, again, I think we're looking for interesting ideas and teams and ultimately isn't team that's being proposed that's the individuals and the organizations involved have the capacity or potential to deliver on the idea so when we look at the qualifications of a principal investigator or project leader if you want uh, if the proposal is saying we're going to be doing this type of research we'd look for some expertise in that area a master's or a PhD may give you some of that. Years experience may give you some of that. You may have individuals within the team that can collectively fulfill that. So effectively, we want to see that the people being identified as principal investigators or leaders of projects are able to rally together the diverse partnership that necessary to deliver on what's being uh, promised in terms of the potential idea. So again, we're open to a variety of uh, possibilities. And indeed, as you remark, Heidi, some of the objectives of Claire will require people with expertise and experience working in non-academic spheres. 
Great, thanks, Bruce. And uh, I do encourage those of you uh, interested in applying for the call to have a look at uh, the call document. I do believe we've given some reference to um, the leadership that we're looking for uh, for these projects, but also the time that we imagine might be required to lead uh, one of these projects. So have a look at that information and feel free to contact us if you have further questions about that. Um, looking again at the questions that we're getting. Um, so there's a question about uh, how many concept notes might be taken forward to the next stage. So um, as, as people will have noticed, this is the first stage uh, of this call process, uh, the call for concept notes, and then we will be shortlisting um, those concept notes to be invited to develop full proposals. Um, now we're, we're we're very conscious of the time it takes to develop full proposals. So we we will not be, um, you know, we have to be reasonable about the number of of uh, full proposals that we invite, but Bruce, maybe you could comment on the roughly the number of concept notes that might be invited to that next stage of this call process. Great, so the honest answer is we don't know yet. Uh, in part, it will be something we'll make a determination upon to ensure that there is enough uh, representation across the themes and regions within that set of uh, projects that or full proposal invitations that will end up with projects that actually cover that we don't want to only have a few proposals in one particular theme. Uh, that being said, we're looking at uh, ideally a sort of three to one or to provide better than uh, one in three chances for those uh, invited to full proposals. So our working assumption is we would invite about 20 uh, proposals for each of the sizes. So if we ultimately are looking at funding eight projects in each uh, size, then 20 full proposals in each size to be able to get to those those final and it may go up a little bit but that's approximately the number i'd expect at the end of the day great and just to complement your answer there and for those who might have been joining a little bit later the sizes that bruce is bruce is referring to are uh, the fact that this call has an opportunity to apply for a larger project size between six to eight million or a smaller project size of up to 1.5 million canadian dollars good okay um i see a lot of questions are still coming in and just a reminder to everybody that we will do our best to get through your questions and any we don't get to uh will be included in our updated faqs after um, after this webinar so there's an interesting question from rachel devlin about what we mean by scientific rigor uh, in the evaluation criteria and She's saying it would be useful to understand how we define scientific in the context of this call. Thanks for your question, Rachel, and I'll pass that over to you, Bruce, maybe to refer to our RQ+. Plus. Um, exactly. Thanks yeah. for that. Uh, suggestion, Heidi. This could be a masterclass in and of itself, and I would invariably make mistakes if I'm trying to, to define it on the fly. Uh, IDRC has been thinking very deeply about this with partners, and there is reference in the, uh, I believe the call document, if not the FAQ, to the Research Quality Plus framework, RQ Plus, and within that is the definition of uh, scientific rigor as will be applied in this concept note process. Great. I'm noting um, that some of my colleagues are answering questions. Uh, there are questions coming through about the budget, but um, just a note to to those of you listening that there are quite a few. There's, you know, there's links to quite a few uh, documents on the IDRC website that will help you to determine what are eligible costs, um, how the budget might be organized. Uh, so please do look at that and contact us if you have further questions. Um, what else are people asking? OK, so there's a question from uh, there's a question from one of our attendees about what we mean by transdisciplinary teams. 
So what types of organization do you anticipate to see in the consortium? And um, I think listeners will have heard a few times that we're looking for diverse teams that are fit for purpose. Um, so we're not really prescribing or, or uh, we don't necessarily, we haven't predetermined, you know, a certain type of uh, team that we're looking for, but Bruce, maybe you could you could speak to um, what we might be looking for around transdisciplinary teams for this call. So in the first instance, I'd say it's in contrast to uh, single discipline type work that's, uh, let's say, geographers looking narrowly at a question only with the uh, theory and approaches of geography. We see that the types of objectives and uh, outputs we're trying to achieve requires collaboration across different ways of thinking, uh, different ideas. Eloquently, I've seen this expressed by our colleague uh, Georgina Kendall in her article on large scale transdisciplinary collaboration that I think we have included in the FAQ as one of the references. So I would just encourage people to go to the bottom of the frequently asked questions and some of the key literature that has informed and inspired us uh, is cited there. And in terms of what do we mean by transdisciplinarity, I referred to that article that was led by uh, Georgina Kandokamp. Great, and um, people will have noticed in the call we make uh, reference to um, diverse teams, um, you know, teams that include uh, potentially novel actors. So, so under Claire, we are looking and hoping to support teams that include those involved in the action of uh, adaptation um, policy or adaptation practice or, you know, the humanitarian sector. So um, do feel free to propose teams that that include partners that aren't necessarily, um, you know, strictly research oriented actors. OK, let me see what else is coming through. Ah, there's a question about who will review the concept notes. So again, uh, this really. Um, ultimately, the concept notes will be reviewed by uh, a panel of external experts. Um, Within IDRC, we will do an initial eligibility screening, but the, the concept notes will, will be re reviewed by external external experts. Maybe just while you're identifying the next question, Heidi, is to also uh, mention that we have intentionally been thinking about ensuring that those reviewers do cover the multiple themes, so the three areas of um, CLARE research that we intend to, to support, as well as include uh, non-academic uh, practitioner perspectives as well to, to provide the same balance within the reviewers that we're hoping for within projects and across the, the entire portfolio. Great, I see a question. Um, can consortiums apply for both the smaller and larger grants? Uh, would you like to take that question, Bruce? Sure, so the simple answer, yes. Uh, we are just laying out in the call process that regardless of how a team organizes itself, smaller projects we're expecting there would be a single grant agreement between the funders and the team and in larger ones we can do up to three because once teams and consortia is a way of organizing a team get certain level of complexity sometimes it's easier to have multiple members receive funding directly but we have to place a limit on that uh, which is why we've said up to three in that case uh, we struggled ourselves when we were writing this document, uh, the call for concept notes, whether to mention consortia specifically, and ultimately decided not to. Uh, we just see that consortia is one way of organizing a team, but we decided to embrace that language of saying, we're looking for teams, however they're organized. And ultimately what we're looking for in those types of teams is the diverse and equitable partnership to deliver on all of the aspects that we've described earlier today. Great. 
Um, and thanks everybody for for your active participation today and for for submitting these questions. OK, another question coming in is, um, does the call allow for implementation or intervention or only for research? Would you like to try? Would you like to answer that question, Bruce? Sure. Uh, yes, it can do implementation. Indeed, we're building on experience here. This isn't coming from nowhere. Uh, Claire itself builds on the experience of predecessor programs, which has included uh, as almost action research live living experiments, uh, pilot interventions and implementation and learning from that. I personally uh, feel passionate about this is an era where we need uh, research to be embedded in climate action. So it is perhaps uh, really attractive to say, not only are we pushing the frontiers of knowledge forward, but we're doing it while engaged in practice. And I can point to multiple other examples, some of which again are highlighted in the re cited references at the end of the uh, frequently asked questions of where embedding research in implementation has already been happening. And I can say on behalf of the CLARE team at IDRC, we would be open to uh, hearing in concept notes ideas on how to do that moving forward. Great. See an interesting question about countries that might be eligible in the call. Um, but that uh, you know have the asterisks beside it that might be identified as countries that could be um, that could require additional um, approvals, I believe, uh, to proceed. And there was a question about whether those uh, countries should be avoided. So maybe you could uh, explain a little bit about how we how we how we manage those countries that. Um, where we've Happy noted to. sort of specific sort of questions about. Thanks. Happy to do so and Heidi, feel free to add from your own experience because you've been working with uh, this dynamic very recently. But to concisely answer the question, no, do not avoid these places. Indeed, some of these places are the most uh, vulnerable landscapes and are the ones that perhaps have the greatest lessons to offer, greatest potential to, to move forward on. Uh, we intentionally provided almost everything in Africa and Asia on the list. Uh, what we've been doing both in the budget categories and here with the asterisks next to some places is being transparent from the point of view of IDRC of where we'll need to have a discussion moving forward. So if a uh, activity is being proposed in a country that has an asterisk beside it, it's because for our own internal purposes, this is some place that we've identified has higher risk for one reason or another. It may be financial banking sector. It could be the existence of political or economic sanctions, often of which will not necessarily impact the type of activity we're talking about. Uh, but there are things that we just realize mm, we'll need to check and make sure that we manage that. Uh, and when I say we, it's yourselves as proponents and ourselves as funders appropriately. So uh, it's being completely transparent. These are places that before we fund an activity in, we really need to make sure we've done our homework. And that is the, the royal we, where both yourselves as a team understand what are the um, potential considerations of carrying out activities in those geographies and ourselves as funders of uh, ensuring that those are taken on board and dealt with appropriately. And again, there's a diversity of experience uh, or potential reasons why an asterisk may appear. Everything from pretend there may be sanctions there, there could be security concerns, there could be financial concerns, and just that uh, we take risks knowingly. So we're not excluding any of these geographies. Uh, I'm not discouraging it. Indeed, I'm encouraging it. And we have in recent times been funding uh, research and action in these places, but want to uh, just make people aware that there will be later down the road that additional sort of, OK, what are the risks and how are we managing them appropriately? Great, that's exactly that. Okay, I see a question about um, 
personnel costs and um, you know if if personnel costs are meant to be approximately 25% of the budget what other um, what other expenditures would we expect and I would just encourage applicants to read through the budget documentation links to see the different categories and to see what are uh, acceptable and eligible expenses related to the different elements of the research project. I'm noting, Bruce, that we are five minutes before the end of our session. Why don't we try and take one or two more questions here? Thanks again. I see a lot of you online, over 400 attendees today, which is amazing, and lots of questions coming through. OK, let me see. Um, larger projects. OK, there's a question from Flip Wester, in terms of larger projects with up to three lead organizations, should one overall lead organization be identified and deliver the principal investigator or all, are all three equal and all need to provide three co-principal investigators? I'll also note that there was a question about um, the number of collaborating institutions, and I think I clarified that 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 does not there's no sort of limit to the number of collaborating organizations as long as the you know the team is fit for purpose and and uh, organized to deliver. But maybe you can answer Flip's question about leads for the larger projects. Great. So. Uh... We purposely chose up to three. How a team decides to organize itself, uh, we leave that largely in the, the hands of the team to, to decide. So for a larger project, uh, it is entirely possible to have one lead organization and identify a single principal investigator, I would imagine. Uh, yet in some other circumstances that may involve multiple geographies or diverse strong organizations that for their own reasons may want to receive funding directly, uh, then it may make sense to have up to three lead organizations. And if it works out to have three or more co-PIs, uh, then let's see how you want to, to propose that. But in the case of uh, larger projects, we've said, you know, three is probably the most that we would want to entertain in terms of lead organizations. And there is a, a natural logic to saying API for organization, but we're not requiring that. So uh, both are possible, Flip. Thanks, Bruce. Um, so many good questions coming through today. Um, I think in the interest of time, we will, we will uh, acknowledge that we've got a lot of questions left to, to respond to. Um, but but I think we'll we'll close at that. I hope the session has been useful for uh, participants today. Uh, again, thanks to all of you for your interest and for participating today. Um, uh, a big thank you to Bruce for his presentation and for fielding so many questions, and to my colleagues Erica, Michele, Mariev, Georgina, Mano, Marco, who have been working behind the scenes to support the event today. Uh, also, thanks to our FCDO colleagues for continued collaboration on this initiative. A reminder again that the session today was recorded, and we will post the link uh, on our website and send that to you in the coming days. Again, for questions that we we just in the interest of time were not able to get to during the session, we will respond to them in an updated version of the FAQs. So please look out for those in the coming week. Also, if you have further questions as you're working through the application process, don't hesitate to reach out to us uh, by email at clairecalls at idrc.ca. We wish you the best of luck with the application process. We look forward to receiving your brilliant concept notes. And a reminder again, that the deadline for this call for concept notes is June 7th. Uh, on behalf of our CLARE team, thank you again so much for attending this webinar and we wish you a good rest of your day. Don't hesitate to be in touch for any questions. Thank you so much.